The story of God is our new series that we're starting, and I love the story of God. Do you know why I love the story of God? Because I am a part of it. I am in the story of God, and you are too. And if people on this planet understood what it means to be in the story of God, they would put their own stories away and then they they would come over and take their place in the story of God. We spend all this time trying to create our own stories, right? We want to do our own thing. We want to create our our own stories. But if we knew that God had a much better story for each one of us, then we would put away our own silly stories and we would come and be a part of God's story. It's a beautiful concept and it's what we're going to be talking about today. And so today as we start the story of God, we're talking about creation. Creation obviously would be first. I have a little bit of common sense and I figured that out. Creation should be the first one. We're going to talk about creation, but we're going to talk about creation in a little bit different way. We're not going to talk about, see, I'm not an apologetics person. I'm not an intellectual person at all. I'm, 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 I'm just a simple person, and, um, and so I'm really not qualified to, to, to teach and uh, expound on, on all the theories, you know, surrounding uh, uh, creation and evolution and all that. So I'm not, that's not what I'm going to try to do. Uh, today, but, but and, and really the miracle of creation is not whether God created the world in six days or whether he created it over millions of years, whether our planet is young, you know, a few thousand years old, or whether it's millions of years old. It, that, that really is not the miracle of creation. The miracle of creation is life. And in Genesis, it says that God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. And this is the one truth that no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, no matter what your background is, no matter how intellectual you are or how much you understand about science and those kinds of things, you cannot get away from this one inescapable fact that all living things on this earth came out of dust. You look, look around. I mean, look around the solar system. Look around uh, as far as we can see, you know. There, there's, no, there's no life anywhere that we can see. And, and so here on this earth, somehow, some way, things, living things happen. And the most incredible living thing is you. We are, we, it, it, I, try to th- I try to think about it this way. I try to think, like, if I was an outsider, if I was an alien, you know, and I didn't know anything about the uh, God or didn't know anything about the earth or the universe or anything, and I was just traveling, you know, at light speed for millions and millions of years, and I'm traveling across the universe at light speed for millions of years and I saw just the same old rocks and dust and planets and stars and incredible heat and incredible cold and then bingo you know I stumble upon this planet and then I and that would be a miracle you know in itself but then you see the the, the people here we're unlike anything else on the earth. We can think. We can reason. And the Bible says something about that. It says that God created us in his image, right? It's absolutely incredible. And God had a plan. He had a plan from the beginning. And so we are going to talk about that plan. And I want to get into the scripture today. We're, we're going to be talking about mainly... Uh, the first chapter of Colossians. But before we get into Colossians, I just want you to understand something about yourself. And we're, we're going to look at Ephesians first. Just a couple of verses. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. 
Okay. When do you think it was that you were created? Was it at your birth? No. Was it at your conception? No, it can be a conception because, see, the, birth, the, the, the DNA that was in your parents, that was in their parents and in their parents and their parents. And, you know, you get the picture all the way back. And, and so that's not when you were created. You were created way back here. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. So everything was in him. And before he spoke it out of him and before it became what it is, Today, before any of that happened, it was all in here, in Him. And that is the time when we were created, when He chose us. Just imagine that. He chose us back then, in him, within Himself. He had already created you, who you are on the outside, but more importantly, who you are on the inside. He had already done that way back here before the creation of the world. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that you're very old. All of you are very old. You're old as the hills. You're old. You've been around a long, long time. He chose us in Him before the creation of the world, and He chose us for a purpose, and this is the purpose, to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now some people who don't believe that God actually has the power to, in reality, change us, change our hearts, change our minds, change our lives, the way we live, the way we think, the way we feel, the people that we are, that people that don't believe, even Christians that don't believe in the transformation that can take place within us, where uh, we can be transformed from the, the person that we were before that was totally self-absorbed and selfish and self-righteous and, and sinful and all those things and be really actually transformed into a humble and beautiful and holy and blameless person, they would say that Jesus just looks through us through, through rose-colored glasses, that he sees us through the lens he sees us through this lens and that he doesn't see who we really are on the inside. And to that, I say uh, that's not true. Jesus sees. He sees who we are. He said this. He said, if you have looked at your neighbor's wife and lusted after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He, he sees. The scripture says that, that people look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And and uh, Jesus also said other things. You know, he said, if, if, you, if you hate your brother and you say, if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. And John, the apostle, said, he said, if you say that you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. God sees it. It's just that we have to, we, we have to understand that God wants to see us when he looks at us, it looks in our heart, he wants to see holy. And he wants to see blameless. And this is why he chose us before the creation of the world. This is part of his plan. Okay, let's move on. In love, still the same passage, still Ephesians, this is 1.5. In love he predestined us for adoption. Now this word adoption means it's a legal term referring to the full legal standing of an adopted male heir in Roman culture. That's the word that's used here. So he's talking about the real thing. This is not some lofty, you know, spiritual concept. He's going to adopt us and, and he's just going to just kind of, you know, accept us, you know, as bad as we are into his family. Now, it's much more than that. It's, it's actually adoption. It is it is actually making us heirs heirs and he he predestined us for adoption to sonship through jesus christ in accordance with his pleasure and will way back then before he created the earth and he was creating us in his own mind in his own heart there was something that he saw in us that brought him pleasure. Pleasure. It brought him pleasure. Can you imagine that? 
God being giddy, you know, over the thought of you? He absolutely is. The fact that you even exist is proof of that. The fact that you even are here. You ever think about the possibility of you being here? It's impossible that you're even here. I don't, even, I don't know what the, the number is, you know, whatever it is to the whatever power to one, you know, is the, the chance that you actually could be here. That, that's amazing that you're even here. Just the fact that you're here, that you could travel at light speed for millions and millions of years and never find any place like this and that you are here on this planet, that ought to excite you that I am alive. I knew this old man, this old black man. He used to sing these spiritual songs. His name was Noonie. And every time I would talk to him, every time I would say, I would say, how are you doing, Noonie? He said, I thank God that he woke me up this morning. See, Noonie, a man who could not read, a man who was illiterate, and uneducated, he knew this one thing. It was a special, special thing that he was alive on this planet. And God takes pleasure. It is his will to take pleasure over us. You have a purpose. All right, let's go to Colossians. Colossians 1. This is Paul writing, and he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. And this is so powerful and so good. I want you to to try to get this uh, today. I want you to to think about it. In fact, let's just pray right now. Lord, uh, as we talk about this scripture, as we talk about this whole concept of who you are and who we are, I ask, Lord, that you would enlighten us by your spirit, by revelation, that you would reveal yourself to us in a new way today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Son is the image of the invisible God. Let's just talk about that. This word image, it actually means image, okay? But there was this concept around this word image that if the image was close enough to the real thing that it would that it could actually become the incarnation of that thing and that's exactly what Jesus was he was the incarnation of God he was God in a human body and he and it says that he is the the son is the image of the invisible God. God, who is invisible, decided to show himself to the people that he created in his own image because he wanted them to know him. And so he he came in human form, and he was the exact image. He was the perfect image of God the perfect image of God, so that we could finally, after thousands of years, that we could finally know God, that humans could finally know God. And so he came and showed himself to us. But then, the very next thing it says, is that he was the firstborn over all creation. Now this word first does not mean first in sequence. It means supreme. It means the best It means the greatest. It means the most awesome firstborn over all creation. He was the Son of God. He was God showing himself to us. But at the same time, at the same time, he was the firstborn over all creation, the greatest human, the most supreme human And he was at the same time showing us who we are. You get that? He's showing us who God, he's showing us who God is. And he's also showing us who we are. See, we think that we could never be sons of God. And let me just say this in, in the scripture. It says that in Christ there is neither male or female, so there's not a gender thing. It's a position thing. We talk about, we talk about 
a son, being sons, uh, sonship, being adopted into sonship. See, the son has the father's blood. He has the, the father's uh, authority. He has the, the inheritance of the father. So it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. There, there is no male or female in Christ. There, it matters your position. And so, uh, so some people think, well, I, you know, I, maybe I'm a, I'm a child of God. I'm, you know, I'm uh, you know, fr- a friend of God. I'm a you know, follower of God. And, and, but what God wants you to be is he wants you to be a son. He wants you to have his, his authority. He wants you to be heir, joint heirs, the scripture says, with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ? How incredible is that? For in him all things were created, in Christ, in Jesus, in the Son. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. There is a person in you that is invisible and it is the person of God. Whenever Jesus said this, he said, I am with you now, but I will be in you. I am with you now, but I will be in you. So there is, so he created everything visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have be, been created through him and for him. See, this, what, what, what God was doing when he cr- created everything was his program. It was his thing. It was what was in his heart. It was what was in his mind. And when it came time to reveal himself in reality to humans... He didn't send someone else. He didn't send Moses. He didn't send Abraham. You know, he didn't send, you know, some prophet or some man. He came in person. This is my project, he thought. This is my project. No one can do what I can do. No one can do this but me. I'm going to the earth in person. I'm going there myself. And so... <clears throat> so all things have been created through him and for him. If you look around and, and, and you look at all creation and you look at all the, 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 the living things on the earth and you look at humans, you, th- you would think, I mean, just, this would be your natural assumption, that, wow, this all looks like it's for us, you know? Looks like it's for us. But really, it's for him. It's just that we play a crucial role in his plan. It's amazing what God is doing. Let's move on. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is a strange thing to say, but he is before all things. He was in the beginning, and in him... All things hold together. I was listening to um, a scientist. In fact, I've, I've heard several different uh, really smart, educated people talk about this concept that, uh, that, that the laws of physics, if there were any any of the laws of physics that weren't as they are, that none of creation could exist. I don't know anything about it. I tried to, look, listen, I, I looked it up last night, and I thought, this is, this, is, this is what I actually thought, and don't laugh. I actually thought that the laws of physics, and like they were maybe four or five laws of physics. That's what I thought. I mean, how many could there be? There's gravity, right? And then there's that thing about uh, motion, you know, uh, equal and opposite reaction, somebody's law, you know. Uh, how many laws of physics could there be? I mean, there's just, seriously. 
I looked it up. 81 important laws of physics. 81 important laws of physics. At least on the website that I was looking at. 81 important laws of physics. I was wondering, how many are there that are not that important? There must be a lot of them. And I've heard this described this way. And, and, and because of the way it was described, I've never forgotten it. But it was described, uh, uh, this talk that I heard, um, it was described as razors balancing each law, you know, balancing one upon the other. And it had, everything has to be Perf- all these laws have to be perfectly balanced one upon the other for, for any of it to work. And that's amazing to me. Do you know who figured that out? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the, and, and the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, the scripture says. And without him, not anything was made that was made. And then that word says in the first chapter of John, became flesh and dwelled among us. This is our God, the creator himself. The creator, if you want to think of God in parts, a lot of people try to think of God in parts, like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But if you want to think of God in parts, what part do you think he would send to the earth. He's going to send the part who is the most invested in this whole creation thing. He's going to send the creator part. And that's who he sent. He sent Jesus. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Without him nothing works. Nothing holds together. The whole machine of creation is kaput. I mean it just it can't exist without him. He holds all things together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Okay, now we know these concepts, but I don't think that we have a revelation of these concepts. He is the head of the body. We know that, right? We know what a human body is is like, right? And, And the head is Christ. The head of the body. It's Christ. You're not the head. I'm not the head. Christ is the head of the body. And the church is the body. I mean, it's pretty plain, right? The church is the body. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. We use this uh, term, born again. Jesus used this term, born again. When we're born again, we are born from the dead. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're born again. We're born from the dead. We, are, we use the, the term resurrection. We're going to talk about resurrection in a couple of weeks. Resurrection from the dead. Jesus was the first. In this case, it is sequence. Firstborn from among the dead so that everything, in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the one that we should look to. I've told you this before, but we shouldn't compare ourselves to other people. Like, I want to be like that person. I, uh, I, I'm sad that this person is better than I am, you know, in this or that. Or I, or I feel good about myself because I'm better than this other person. No, compare yourself to Christ. Compare yourself to Christ. The one who was holy and who was blameless. Compare yourself to him. And then ask him to transform you. And he, this is exactly what he wants to do, by the way. He wants to transform us to the image of Christ. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. He was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. There are several scriptures that say this exact same thing. And through him to reconcile to himself all things... All things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile to himself. Do you see what he's doing? 
We're going to talk about the fall next week. But before the fall happened, everything was good, right? Everything was good. Uh, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, they were obedient to God. They loved God. God walked with them in the cool of the evening. Imagine that. They had no shame. They had no guilt. They had no sin. But then the fall happened. And now Jesus has come to reconcile everything back to himself. And it says to reconcile to himself all things. All things. He wants to reconcile everybody and everything back to himself. The choice, though, whether we become part of this story is ours. He has given us free will. And we have this free will. We can, we can choose God or we can reject God. Most of p- the people on the planet have chosen to reject God. And, and, and live their own, li- their own way. Most of the people in our culture choose to reject Him and live their own way. But God has sent Jesus and, and the Creator, the, the Creator part of Him, into the world to reconcile all things back to Himself. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. This is amazing to me. Things on earth or things in heaven. Are there things in heaven that have to be uh, reconciled back to God? There's a lot of stuff that's fascinating. I don't know the answer to all these things. But I think it's, it's pretty interesting. By making peace through His blood shed on the cross so what jesus did on the cross what jesus did on the cross when jesus said it is finished everything that he had to do in order to make reconciliation with the world and see a lot of people think that jesus came and He's just going to meet us halfway. He came to make a deal, you know. And some people think that the deal is kind of like this. God gives me salvation, and I give him three hours a week. I give him, I go to church, that's an hour. I go to a small group, that's another hour. And I serve and take some position in church and serve. And that's my other hour. And, and, and a lot of people think that this is the kind of deal that Jesus came to strike with us. That he came, and, and you hear this, you hear this, every church you go to, you know, you hear this, we, we need you to come give, serve, join a small group. And, uh, and those are actually the things that it takes to keep the organization running. Okay? But... What Jesus came to do is he came to reconcile you. He's given you an opportunity to follow him. He's given you an opportunity, all of us, an opportunity to become the people that he envisioned and that gave him pleasure all those many, many years ago or i don't know how many years it was and you don't either but way back before creation when he was thinking about you and he had pleasure in his heart he was had pleasure and and according to his will you know he created us according to his will scripture says he works in us both to will and to do his pleasure and and so some people think that he just has come to make a deal with us meet us halfway but he wants us all of us he wants every bit of it in the old testament the principle the giving principle was 10 percent, right in the new testament they gave everything when you look at the early church they gave everything they understood this con- concept and and i don't believe that uh god wants you to bring <laughs> everything you own and bring it to the church i don't believe that at all But I'm just telling you that in their heart, in this early church, their love and compassion toward each other was so much. And their willingness to give their whole selves to Jesus was such 
that they were willing to literally bring everything that they had and lay it at the feet of Jesus. God has come to bring us. Grace is a bridge. To bring us into this glorious kingdom of God and to transform us into his image. And it is an amazing thing. I want to leave you with what Billy Graham, what his message was. If you, if you listen to a, a preacher long enough, um, you'll figure out what his theme is. You know, you, you listen to these guys, guys that I grew up hearing on television like uh, Oral Roberts, you know, something good is going to happen to you today. Um, the point of contact, you know. My, my mother used to watch Oral Roberts on Sunday morning, so I know about Oral Roberts. And, uh, and he... And he would, and it was about faith, and it was about healing, and the point of contact, and you know something good is going to happen. And then, uh, you know, there are other other pastors. You know, some of them major on faith, and then some of them major on some type of um, you know theological principle. Um, some of them I agree with, some of them I don't agree with. But Billy Graham had a simple message, and this was his message: God loves you. And he has a plan for your life. And that message went out. And that message saved millions. The greatest evangelist in all of human history. And we got to live in the same time that he lived. God loves you. And he has a plan for your life. That is a simple, simple message. And that is the message of Christ. He loves you. You are on his agenda. You are part of his plan. You are part of his creation. And it break, absolutely breaks his heart when we turn the other way. And we say, I want to go my own way. And I don't want to go your way. God. I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. I don't, I, don't, I don't want what you have to offer. It breaks his heart because he's heavily, heavily invested. Love demands a sacrifice. You know that love demands a sacrifice, don't you? Because you love people that you've sacrificed for. You love people who have torn your heart out. And that's what we are doing to God when we go our own way. God loves us and he has a plan for our lives.